The Bible is our guide, and we need to read it as often as we can if we want to follow God. Today, Pastor Lemming continues his Seven Habits series. If you'll find your place in your Bible with me this morning at Psalm chapter 19, in just a little while we're going to be reading several verses uh, from that psalm, but today we continue in this series that we started uh, a few weeks ago called Seven Habits of Deeply Spiritual People. The first habit that we talked about over the course of two messages was that of worship. Uh, if we're going to be a people who are deeply spiritual, who have a heart for God, who are seeking God with all of their being, who are friends of God, who are walking with God, we've got to learn to worship. We've got to learn to worship personally and privately. We've got to learn to work, worship corporately in the gatherings of the people of God. But today we're going to talk about this matter of the Scripture itself and the importance of the Scripture in our lives when it comes to the matter of being a deeply spiritual person. John Piper is a well-known name. He is a contemporary of our day. He's a theologian. He's an author. He was a pastor. On one occasion, he said, I've never met a mature, fruitful, strong, spiritually discerning Christian who is not full of Scripture, devoted to regular meditation on Scripture, and given to storing it in the heart through Bible memorization. Then he finishes by saying, and that's no coincidence. It's not something that just happens to you, but it's something that's real, and it's something that's intentional that occurs in our lives. When we allow the word of Christ to dwell in us, Jesus said we're to dwell in him, we're to abide in him, and his word is to abide in us. Paul put it this way in the book of Colossians. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, if we're going to be a deeply spiritual person, not only must we be people who worship God, we must be people who are reading his word and learning and studying his word. You know, common sense tells us that we have to know his word to have a meaningful walk with him, doesn't it? Can you remember, some of you will remember well, but can you remember back when desktop computers were first coming out? And you know, today we carry a computer in our hands everywhere we go, but there was a time that you couldn't carry that computer in your hand. It took up an entire desktop, and it was a rectangular box made by IBM, and sitting on top of that rectangular metal box was a screen. If you got all the wires rightly plugged in, if you got them all rightly plugged in, and you plugged it into the wall and you turned on the switch, it brought you up to this glorious screen with a blinking cursor. <laughs> and then you had to do what? You had to go get those manuals, whatever those manuals were. There were several in my box. And you had to read the manuals. I remember going to a Barnes of Noble one time when I was traveling somewhere, and I went to the section on computers, and I was looking for that section where, that book where it said, Computers for Dummies. Because when I opened that book, none of it made sense to me. But the longer I have dealt with it, the more I have used the computer, the more comfortable I've become with it. Today, computers are uh, you almost don't need a manual. You plug them in. But when it comes to some of the programs that are operating in the computer, you've got to be willing to go to the help screen or you've got to be willing to ask somebody to help you to be able to deal with the different things that will arise when you're using that computer. I mean, if you're going to know a computer, you're going to know how to program it. You're going to know how to use it. You're going to know how to use the programs. You've got to read the book. And what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to take you into this psalm, and I want to show you why the Scripture is so very important in our lives. David looks up, and David sees the beauty and the majesty of the sky, and he begins to think about his God. Look what he says, verse 1, Psalm chapter 19. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. You hear what he says? Do you realize that there's nobody that can look at creation and say, I don't know there's a God? There is nobody who can look at creation and say, I don't know there's a God? The reality is when you look at creation, God is shouting at us. There are no words being spoken. There, there are no vocal cords that are moving. But God is speaking. I am the one who put all this in its place. I am the one who created everything there is. 
And it shows forth the glory and the majesty of the Almighty God. The firmament is His handiwork. It's not a matter of chance and long periods of time. It's the work of the designer, the architect, whose name is Elohim, whose name is Yahweh, whose name is Jehovah. He created it all. He goes on, verse 2, day unto day. This goes on every single day. He says, day unto day, it utters speech. Hey, this is speech you can't hear with your physical ears. This is speech, listen to me, this is speech that you hear with your eyes. Did you know you can hear with your eyes? Are you all with me? This is speech you can hear with your eyes because you look at it and you know it's speaking to you day unto day, utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. You look up and you know that there's a God who's greater. The creator is always greater than his creation, right? The inventor is always greater than his invention, right? He continues, verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. There is nobody that's outside of the revelation of the skies around them. There is nobody. Isn't that what Romans chapter 1 means? That nobody is without excuse? That, that men can look up and they can see the creation of God and they can know that there is a God because of that creation that millions and billions of years don't bring about order. They bring about disorder. Listen to what he said. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Listen to me today. You may choose to disbelieve this book. You may choose to disbelieve his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but the reality is you will not escape if you don't come to Jesus and trust him as your Savior. You will not escape the judgment of God for your unbelief if you do not come to Jesus and trust him for eternal life. He goes on, verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world, the line. Some of your translations will translate it as the word sound. But the Hebrew word literally means a measuring line. When you look up into heaven, you recognize that there is a God. And if there is a God, it means I have to answer to that God. I am responsible to that God. That line has gone out through all the world. And all their words, their words to the end of the world, everybody can look up and know there's a God. Then he talks about the sun. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Now watch how he does this, this beautiful picture of a Jewish wedding. Notice it, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Doesn't it seem like the days get faster and faster to you? <laughs> okay, so you're still young. You think it's never going to pass quickly enough. Can I ever get out of college? Can I ever get to my career? I can remember when I used to think, am I ever going to get married? Will, will we ever get to the wedding day? And my father-in-law loved to pick on me and tell me over and over, David, the rapture's going to occur for your wedding. Rapture's going to occur before your wedding. You don't need to worry about the wedding. The rapture's going to occur before your wedding. And 46 years later, Mary's saying, I wish the rapture had occurred before our wedding. <laughs> It's like a bridegroom. The son is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Every day he runs that same race right across the sky, just like he always does. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit, that's its path to the other end. You know, the sun never gets up in the north and goes down in the south. It, it always gets up in the east and goes down in the west, right? Unless your, your compass is messed up. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Oh, did we find that out? That's why we get those umbrellas on the beach. I'm looking for shade when that sun's out about 11 o'clock, noon, or 1 o'clock. Right? 
And so he's looking up into the heavens above and he's talking about the skies above him. And you can see David, is, he's processing all of this in his mind and he's thinking about the greatness of his God, the greatness of the God of Israel, the greatness of the God of all of mankind who's made all of this and who's put all of it in its place and it glorifies God and it speaks to every single person though they don't hear it with their ears, they hear it with their eyes. And they know there must be the creator God. But then he moves, and where we're going to spend the next few minutes, from this matter of the revelation of God in the sky to the revelation of God in the scriptures. And if you're keeping notes, you're going to want to write these things down. We're going to go through them quickly, but I hope you'll keep a tab on these things because this is the reason why you ought to be reading your Bible if you hold this book in your hand and this is the eternal, inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God, how can you lay it aside and not pick it up and read what it says? If you want to know God, if you want to be a friend of God, if you want to have a heart for God, if you want to walk with God, you got to know what he says. Let's talk first of all about the sufficiency of Scripture, verses 7 to 9. I want you to notice, first of all, it converts the soul. Look at verse 7. The law is perfect, converting the soul. The word convert means to restore something to its original condition. Can I just tell you that when you read the Word of God, you find comfort and you find peace and you find hope and you find help and you find strength. You find correction. You find confession. But you find all of these things in this book that we call the Bible. Aren't we thankful that it converts and it restores the soul? Earlier this year, I was uh, having a physical problem going on, and I'll just be honest with you. I became depressed, extremely depressed. Only the second time in my life that I've ever been that depressed in my entire 60, going on 65 years, that I was ever that depressed. Numbness in my feet that moved up into my calves, that moved up into my thighs, that comes all the way across the middle of my body. I didn't know what was going on. And the doctors looked at me and they said, what in the world? Four MRIs, a CAT scan, uh, a nerve conduction test. Oh, the joy of a nerve conduction test. <laughs> Multiple blood tests. I still have four more, not blood tests, I still have four more tests to go. I was depressed. That was why I wasn't here for two Sundays. I couldn't bear to stop to get everything together, to pull myself together, to be able to get to the pulpit and to preach the word of the living God. I called some of the staff to my house and I said, you got to take care of this for the next few weeks. I sat in my chair. By the way, I don't recommend doing what I did. It was the wrong thing to do. I sat in my chair and I read the Bible almost non-stop. If I quoted a verse of scripture once, this particular verse once, I quoted it a thousand times. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I quoted Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from which comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. I read the Psalms, the 150 chapters of the Psalms twice through. I read numerous other books of the Scripture. I was bathing my soul in the Word because I knew that what I needed was not medicine. What I needed was the restoring of the Word. I'm glad to be able to stand before you today. I still have all the same symptoms. No symptoms have gone away. They're exactly like they were when they began at the end of January and the first of February, but I'm ready to go forward in the power and the energy of the Holy Spirit to see God do something great and to see God do something mighty. Why? Because the Word of God, it's sufficient to convert the soul. It instructs the simple. Notice it. Chapter 19, verse 7, the second part, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Do you know what I mean when I say the simple? Uh, when we talk about the person who is simple, we're talking about somebody who believes anything. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15 says, the simple believes every word. 
but the prudent concerns, concerns, uh, considers well his steps. The simple believes every word. I want to believe what people say to me. I, I want to believe the best about people. But I've learned over the course of my life that you've got to take everything, with, as my mother would say, with a grain of salt. You've got to take everything with a measure of skepticism. You can't be simple-minded that you just believe anything and everything that comes along. you got to have some, what's the word? It starts with the letter D, discernment. you got to have some discernment in life or you end up making really bad choices and going down really bad paths. Not only does the sufficiency of the Scripture convert the soul and instruct the simple, it rejoices the heart. Look at chapter, uh, chapter 19, verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Aren't you thankful? The psalmist says in Psalm 30, verse 5, that weeping lasts for the night. But what comes in the morning? Joy. Can you say it with me? Joy comes in the morning. The Word of God rejoices the heart. It not only rejoices the heart, it enlightens the way. Verse 8. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the way. Don't you like what Psalm 119, verse 105 says? Your word will be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It endures the ages, chapter 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. This book isn't going away. It's settled in heaven forever. You realize that the Bible is the most despised, derided, denied, disputed, dissected, and debated book in all history. And yet through all of those attacks, through all of those centuries from those who are within religious or within Christendom and those that are outside of Christendom, do you know what's still here? The Bible is still here. The Bible is still the most read, the most published, the most translated book in the world. And most importantly, if you read it, it's a book that will transform your life. This book we call the Bible, it also reveals, it reveals the truth. Look at verse 9, second part of verse 9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are true. Get that? They are true and righteous altogether. The Word of God reveals the truth. You say, well, I'm studying truth in the halls of academia. Well, you may be studying some aspects of truth, but if you're not studying the Bible and reading the Bible for yourself, you're not getting the core of what is truth. You got to read the scripture. You got to know what the Bible says. Not only the sufficiency of scripture, we want to talk about the significance of scripture. I want you to know that you want to read your Bible, the significance of scripture. Notice verse 10, verse A. I want you to see this greatest possession. He says, more to be desired. This book that we're talking about, he uses all of these different uh, words, law, testimony, statutes, commandment, all of these different things he uses as synonyms for the word of God. And then he comes in verse 10, he says, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Do you realize what you've got in your hands? You've got Fort Knox in your hands. Are y'all with me? You got Fort Knox in your hands. It's the greatest possession. It's not only the greatest possession, it's the greatest pleasure. Look at the second part of verse, uh, verse 10. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. It's the greatest pleasure. We have people in our church who have beehives. Now, I'm thankful that they have beehives because I don't want to have beehives. One of the men, I heard him telling the story how some of those bees got up underneath the hood that you wear when you're dealing with them, and they started stinging him on the face and on the neck. I don't like pain of any kind. But I am so thankful that he has those beehives, and he goes out and he takes care of those little bees out there. I say little bees. They are little, but there's a whole bunch of them, and they can do a lot of damage if they all get on you. Like an Alfred Hitchcock movie coming after you. when he brings that honeycomb out and he puts that honey in a jar and he hands it to you, huh. let's just go to heaven now. <laughs> it's as good as it gets. It's the greatest possession. It's the greatest pleasure. It's the greatest protection. Verse 11, the first part, moreover, by them, your servant is worn. Listen, you want to make better decisions? Understand and read the Bible for yourself. 
Get to know it for yourself. It's not only the greatest possession and the pleasure and protection, it's the greatest profit. The second part of verse 11, and in keeping them, there is great reward. In this world, you may be persecuted for keeping the word of God, but when you stand before Jesus, you don't get into heaven for the works you do, but you'll be rewarded for the works that you do. And it's the greatest purification. Verses 12 to 14, who can understand his errors? I mean, can you search all that there is in your life to expose the things that need to be made right before God? Even the best amongst us can't know everything about ourselves and all the areas where we may have something that needs to be confessed before God, but you know what can? The Word of God. He says, cleanse me, the psalmist says, from secret faults. That's things that nobody else knows about, maybe I don't even know about. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. That's the ones you know and you do anyway. Let them not have dominion over me. I don't want to be brought under their control. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. And then he cries out in this great prayer, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want you to turn with me over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I've got to hurry here. Stay with me. Come on. Move quickly. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You know the verse. He says, be diligent. Paul talking to young Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's he telling you? What's he telling Timothy? What's he telling me? To be an effective student of the scripture, you need three things. Number one, you need desire. The word diligent literally means to be eager. Remember when you got up this morning and you were eager to eat breakfast? You remember when the service goes over, those of you that come to the second service on occasion and the service goes over noon and you're eager to get out, to get to the restaurant? The eagerness, we're to be diligent. Old, old, old King James says, study to show yourself approved. It means to be diligent about it, to be eager, to desire it with all of your heart. I mean, if you don't desire the Word of God, something is spiritually wrong. As newborn babes, Peter says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the Word. Do you have to convince a baby to desire milk? Not unless there's an illness in the baby. To be an effective student, you need desire. To be an effective student, you need discipline. You notice he goes on here, says, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. You, you know, on Monday morning, you're probably like me. I don't always want to get up and go to work. Although I do love what I'm doing, so I don't have as much trouble as some of you do have, having to get up on Monday morning and go to work. The reality is a lot of days you get up and you don't want to have to go off to work, right? That's why, right? That's why you got a lot of people who say, I don't want to go back to the office. I want to, tele, I want to telework. I want to sit in my pajamas, why a lot of people aren't coming back to church. I like to sit in my pajamas and watch the service online. Well, if you're sick or you're providentially hindered, that's okay. But if you're not sick or providentially hindered, you ought to be here with the people of God. Amen. Discipline. If you're going to study the Word of God, it takes discipline. You're not going to wake up one day and say, oh, all of a sudden I know all the Scripture." You got to discipline yourself to read it. You got to discipline yourself to study it, to take it in. You got to discipline yourself. All you teachers in the room, all of you lovely teachers, thank God for you teachers. You had a lot of students like me. You probably just passed this along just to get us out of your class into the next grade. All you incredible teachers, thank God for every one of you. You're missionaries in the school system. Thank God for you. But you got to understand something. You don't look at your first grader or your second grader. For that matter, you don't look at your 10th grader or your 11th grader and say, well, you know what? I hope you get this. You know what you tell them? You tell them if you don't apply yourself to this task, you won't, what with the class? You won't, what starts with a P, you won't pass this class. Now, I know there's some geniuses amongst us. I'm grateful to be one of them, but there's some geniuses amongst us. And some of you don't have to study for anything. When the teacher teaches it the first time, you got it. You don't have to go back over it. That was never me. I went back over it a dozen times and still didn't get it all. 
You tell those students they got to have discipline. You got to set aside time. You got to be at the right place. You got to get quiet. You got to study the material. You got to memorize it. You got to learn it. There's got to be discipline. Number three, be an effective student. There's got to be diligence. He says, rightly dividing the word of truth, diligence. Hey, look, sometimes we divide over the silliest of things, but doctrine is important. And rightly dividing the word of truth is important. And we're never going to stop telling you that doctrine is important. Let's just play all that stuff down because it keeps people away. Well, first of all, the gathering of believers is first and foremost primarily for the believer. We're always thankful for the unbelievers who join us, and we want them to know the love of Christ from us. But the reality is this is a family gathering. And doctrine is absolutely important. Doctrine is how you understand God. You got to have diligence to rightly divide the word of truth. Do you understand what he's saying? He's telling us that this book that we hold in our hands that is so valuable, like a gold mine, that does all of these things for us when we read it and we learn it and we study it and we take it in and we meditate on it, that the reality is that the effort we put into it is worth, is, is worth the process. The process is worth the effort. Let me turn it around. The process is worth the effort. It's worth the effort. There was a man in Kansas City that was severely injured in an explosion. The victim's face was badly disfigured. He lost his eyesight. He lost both of his hands. He was a new Christian, and his greatest disappointment was that he could no longer read the Scripture. Then one day, he heard about a lady in England who was reading Braille with her lips. So he ordered a Bible, parts of a Bible, in Braille. But much to his dismay, he, he discovered that even the nerve endings in his lips had been destroyed by the explosion. But one day, as he brought one of the Braille pages to his lips, his tongue happened to touch a few of the raised characters. His tongue touched a few of the raised characters, and he could feel them. And like a flash, he thought, I can read the Bible using my tongue. And as of the telling of that story, he had already read the Bible through four times in Braille with his tongue. What's your excuse? What's my excuse? There is no excuse. If we're going to have a deep spiritual walk with God, where we have a heart for God and we see things through the lens of God, we have the wisdom of God where we know God more deeply, we have got to read this book. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope this message made a difference for you. If you would like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We would love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.